Do I go just continue? On behalf of Equestrian Canada, we welcome everyone to joining our third webinar offered to our dressage community. This webinar is being provided in English. However, we welcome French questions. Selene hutchison Majeris can support with any French inquiries. We hope you find this session both informative and entertaining. For those not familiar with the Zoom features, we ask that you mute your line to avoid any background interference during the session. If you wish to submit a question, please do so using the Q&A function. As we have a lot of people joining us tonight, we do ask for your patience if we experience technical difficulties during the session. So without further delay, I introduce you to our presenters for tonight. Joan McCartney is a well-known retired FEI four-star dressage judge and current EC and USCF senior judge. Celine hutchison Majeris is the dressage coordinator responsible for the Am I Ready program and portfolio at the Equestrian Canada office. Without further delay, I turn it over to our presenters to start our session. Joan, you just have to take yourself off mute. So this evening we'll be starting with dressage training scale and Joan will be introducing that. Okay, thanks, Celine. Um, hello everyone, I'm pleased to chat with you this evening about dressage scoring. For those of you familiar with dressage and judging, you'll know that scoring is really complicated. There are many factors and it is critical that we as judges get the scoring right. Our riders are spending a lot of money on their horses, their training, getting to shows and so on, and they deserve the best um, education and scoring that we can provide. So um, this, I only have a short time on uh, the scoring, so we will start with the basics. And um, <clears throat> so I'll start with, our main guide is the training scale. And this was discussed in an earlier webinar, and you will see this on the screen. So you'll notice and you'll recall the rhythm being the first level, suppleness the second, connection, impulsion, straightness, and um, collection. And as the horse goes through the training, they proceed through these different levels. Then we have as our guide, as judges, we have our EC rules. And I refer you to the EC dressage rule book, article 9.7 for details on judging a test. And the descriptions of the movements are also found in the rule book. So here we get to judging. The judging is a balance of correct training and quality. One must consider the level of the test and the purpose plus the directives noted in each judging box. It is a combination of these factors that lead to the score for each box. So let's take a look at first level test one. Can we do that one, Celine? Yep, there we are, first level test one. So, First of all, the most important thing that we look at that test is the purpose. And here we see the purpose, and it's that the, we're looking at the correct basics, and in addition to the requirements of training level, has developed the thrust, really important word at first level, to achieve improved balance and throughness, and maintains more consistent contact with the bit. So overall, our purpose in first level. And then we're doing this particular test, so we go to the first movement, the first box, and we look at the directives. And we see the key in the directives, regularity, quality of trot, willing, clear transitions, straightness, attentiveness, immobility, three seconds minimum. So you can see there's a lot that the judge has to consider in coming up with the score for that box. So since we're talking about these directives, I always encourage riders, 
do make sure you look closely at the directives because that is the key for what the judge will be looking for when they are scoring that particular movement. So we look at how the partnership fulfills the elements of that box. We look, are the basics established? According to the training scale, do we see clear gates? Is the horse relaxed, swinging forward in a confident contact? And the level of the test, was the criteria of the movement met? What is the essence? And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And what are the modifiers of the movement? So let's look at an example of how we would judge first level test one, the first movement. So as in the directive, we're looking for the regularity of the trot, the clear willing transitions, straightness, attentiveness, and the immobility. Okay, so you, and so we are looking at all those factors. We do identify the essence of the movement, which is the most important component, and that would be the halt and salute. I think riders would agree that's the key point. And then the transitions in and out are modifiers, and they can be used to either increase or decrease that score. So we go then through our test, all of the, the um, components, considering the directives and the movements, and we have to give that score. So deciding on the score, let's look at the scale of marks. Okay, okay, so scale of marks. I always like to start with a 10. I think there's our excellent score and that's one that everyone should strive to achieve. It really indicates that here we've seen harmony, ease of work, cadence, and you can't imagine the movement being done any better. And that's the movement that will deserve that 10. So I always like to uh, encourage riders and say, you know, this is an achievable mark. And my, in my own experience, I find in national tests, a 10 most often occurs at the start or finish of the test. When the horse comes down center line, absolutely straight, in balance and rhythm, full of impulsion and directly into a square halt. So th this is a really important movement. It is your door, your opening to get that 10. So I encourage people to work on that one. A nine is very good. There's a high degree of brilliance in all parts of the movement. Most of the movements have been probably excellent, but there's probably some little pieces that are not quite as good, that do not warrant the 10. And I would think most often it might be a transition that's not clear. But, you know, really, nines and tens are truly goosebump material. If, we're, if you're a judge and you see that going on in your ring, boy, you are one happy judge. And uh, then we have the eight is good, which indicates you have satisfied the requirements and executed the movement with an S. All parts of the movement are clearly defined, smoothly connected, and show impulsion and balance. It's not as precise as the nine or 10, but we would all be happy to have those eights on our score sheet. A seven is fairly good. The movement is basically done correctly, just needs a little more consistency with impulsion, suppleness, and cadence. Basic qualities are clear, and shows a certain amount of harmony and ease. And I, I think a test with consistent sevens is a pretty nice test and one anyone could be proud of. Now we're going down a little further to a six, which is satisfactory. And if you're a rider, you know that there are probably many sixes or in that range that are out there. This score covers many aspects. When the movement may be basically correct, it probably lacks suppleness, lacks some balance, maybe the contact is inconsistent, maybe there's some inaccurate work and that has an impact. So a six. A five is sufficient, you're just at the borderline, but it is acceptable. And while lacking in some of the criteria we've mentioned for other movements, such as suppleness, impulsion, and accuracy, 
Um, there's just, there can be also inconsistency with the contact. So it's just a borderline score. Going to the four, now we're into the insufficiency where it's unacceptable, the movement lacking in quality, losing regularity, breaking pace. That's often what happens and results in a four. Jogging through parts of the walk. A three, fairly bad. Incorrect resistance. And you know, there's just every now and then you get those naughty moments and that may well result in that three. Uh, two is bad, severe resistance, as is one, very bad, severe resistance as well, and zero, not executed. So practically nothing of the movement has been performed. So again, I, I go back and to any time I do clinics or talk to riders, I really encourage them to go for those high marks, go for those tens. They're out there and they're ready to be ready to be had on your sheet. So in addition to the scale of marks you see in front of you, we also give half marks from 9.5, but I'm not sure who would give 9.5, I think it's that good, you're probably a 10, to 0 0.5. But half marks came into existence probably, oh, I don't know, six or seven years ago, and were certainly welcomed by the judges, and I think by most riders, as it provided an opportunity for we as judges to be even more precise in giving a score. Prior to this, we could be between a six and a seven, and you know, it, it was unclear as to which way to go. This way, a six five is there, or maybe it's a seven five, it's almost an eight. So there's good use for those half marks. So as judges, we're encouraged to use all of the scale of marks as appropriate. We're encouraged to recognize what is good and reward what is good, but at the same time, when things go a bit awry, we have a responsibility to reflect that in the scoring. And I will say one of the beauties of this type of competition is that each movement is marked separately. So if by some chance one makes a blunder, something happens, you know, it will impact that score and hopefully the rider can get back on track and uh, continue on in a positive manner. The other part too of, of tests is there are coefficients. So um, important movements, extra difficult movements will have a coefficient of two. And oftentimes the coefficient um, comes into a movement and we'll see on the screen here, we can just go back up to the previous screen. Oh yes, right there, yeah, the working counter. Oftentimes the coefficient is, um, when a movement is introduced for the first time. And I'll say in third level, flying changes are introduced. So each of the opportunities for flying changes has a coefficient of two. And you can see in this test in front of you, there's a coefficient in movement 12, working canter right lead. And that is again in our first level test. There's also a coefficient for the truck stretch circle. That's a really important movement. So it has a little extra recognition. So when anyone is planning their ride, note where these coefficients are located and give that extra preparation to those movements. Those are valuable points. And then we go down to the bottom of our test and we have the collective marks. And these um, enable the judge to provide a summary of the highlights. Whoops, we just, yeah, there we are. A uh, summary of the highlights and challenges of a test and make suggestions for improvement. Um, I, I think this is pretty valuable feedback to the rider and is really important for that rider to know, you know, where there could be improvement, what they could do. And I know many riders who tell me they look at the collectives as the first, as the first thing once they get their test, but really, I think they've seen their score before them. So we look at gates, a score for freedom and regularity, and that's all through gates. Impulsion, desire to move forward, elasticity of the steps, suppleness of the back, engagement in the hindquarters. And here we're looking for, I like to think of it as an eager energy forward with the soft and swinging back and not hurried. Submission, 
There's also an, another important one, willing cooperation, harmony, attention and confidence, acceptance of the bit and aids, straightness, lightness of forehand. And so the willing and confident are two words that we use over and over again, as well as harmony. So it, this is where that is scored. Riders, the rider gets two, um, there's two positions for rider scores, one for the rider's position and seat, and the second one for the correct and effective use of aids. Both of these are critical. You'll know the correct and use of aids also uh, includes the accuracy of the test. So, you know, you ask yourself as a judge, is this rider effective? Is the rider in harmony with the horse? Are the movements well prepared and accurate? So those are all considerations in arriving at the collective marks. So that takes me to the end of um, just the, the marks, the scoring, and providing a brief overview of scoring. There's lots to learn. But, and I say over and over again, important is the harmony and the happy athlete. That's what we all want to see and hopefully everyone strives for that, for that um, level. So now we'll move on to the Am I Ready program and Celine, Celine will give an overview of this new important program. Celine. Thank you ever so much, Joan. I really appreciate you going over all this material. So tonight I'm gonna to present to everyone the Am I Ready program. Again, my name is Celine hutchison Majeris. I'm the coordinator for dressage at Equestrian Canada. Bonjour à tout le monde, mon nom c'est Céline hutchison Majeris. Si vous avez des questions en français, à fin de la présentation, vous trouvez mon courriel électronique. So I've just finished saying that at the end of this presentation, you will find my contact information. Should you have additional questions, we are more than welcoming them and you're more than welcome to send it to me. So a little bit about the Am I Ready program. It is a fairly new program to Equestrian Canada. We are under a strict licensing agreement with the US with regards to where and how we can utilize the tests. The tests are primarily being utilized in that, in a competition. Here we are permitted to utilize the tests for educational purposes. So that being said, you will not have the final collective marks at the very end. However, you will have a judge's summary and each of your movements can be judged, those being for the dressage test. So what does this really provide you as a rider? It provides a development opportunity to assist you in moving further with your own knowledge on those tests and the movements. It prepares you for the competitions, so you'll get actually the feedback from our judges here at Equestrian Canada and the officials, as I say, and you can share this with your coach. You could share this if you've got, for example, a son or a daughter who's interested in dressage, or you just want to learn a little bit more. The program is offered free of charge to anyone who is a current Equestrian Canada um, sports license holder. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to share my screen with you and show you where to find this program. So just give me one moment here. It's just taking me a moment, sorry folks. So where are you gonna find the Am I Ready program location? I know many of us question where you'll find information on the site. So what you would do is go and to equestriancanada.ca forward slash sports. So sports is found in the banner located at the top of the web page. And I'm just trying to take my indicator there now for you. Underneath that, you would select dressage. And then within dressage, there's programs. And if you scroll down approximately halfway down the page, you'll actually end up finding information on the Am I Ready series. So both the portal as well as a user's guide. 
Tonight, I will give a brief overview of the program. Please do take some time to take a look at the user's guide, or if you've got more detailed questions, by all means, please reach out to us. We're more than happy to help. Before I move on to the next point here, I had a very interesting question come in from Lorraine Hill. And she'd asked, how is judging in dressage live different than judging virtually? Which will get me into my next point here. One of the big things when you go to log on, or before you logging on, is giving a lot of consideration to the video and what in fact you're submitting. So please be cognizant that a poor, distant video, something that's lacking in contrast, or even myself tonight, I've got sunlight coming in through the windows behind me, can make it rather challenging to see the individual or the horse. Um, at this level, you are more than welcome to put bandages on or boots and that may help. Keep in mind as well, if you're wearing a dark colored shirt against a dark colored horse against a dark colored background, it will make it quite challenging for our judges to in fact properly gauge your positioning and whatnot. So here we talk a little bit, and I'm just gonna skim over this, but where the camera should be placed. We'd like it placed at the letter C, which would be the same area that a judge would be judging from in a normal competition. We ask that it be roughly five to eight feet high. And again, this is to run parallel with what a true competition would be. And the distance that we ask that it be back from the letter C is in fact about five meters or 16 and a half feet. One of the challenges, and I'm sure you've all experienced it, trying to see a video on YouTube or elsewhere and seeing it where it was handheld and quite unsteady. Again, this leads to the quality of that video and how easy it is or not easy for that matter for our judges to do their job in reviewing it. If zooming, be quite careful and perhaps practice a little bit ahead of time as to how you zoom in and out so that we're still seeing some of the markers around the horse and the horse really shouldn't pick up more than about a quarter of the screen. We'd like to be able to see the top of the rider all the way down to those horses hooves and the letters should be clear. And we ask that the video start roughly five seconds before the rider comes down the center line. If you're riding inside an arena and don't have that opportunity to come in from the outside or the exterior of the ring, just take a moment and come in from one of the sides as you would and as closely as you can to that center line to start. We do realize that there are situations where you don't necessarily have a 20 by 40 or you may not have a 20 by 60. So please do just the best that you can. The other thing I should point out at this particular point in time is that you're more than welcome also to submit a snippet of one particular test or one particular movement that you may be having a challenge with. So for example, if it's Piaf and Passage at the higher level, you're more than welcome to submit that. Or for example, if you're having an issue perhaps with a lengthen or an extension and you wish to have some judges feedback to see if that's being done correctly, you may also do that. The one thing to note, and I've just brought it onto the screen right now, is that videos are to be the real thing. We ask that they not be edited, please. We ask that there be no audio, no music tracks added. As well, coaching during the test is not permitted. That said though, if you need it, by all means, make use of a caller. This is meant as an educational opportunity for you. As I said earlier, boots and bandages may be worn and adapt your test as you need to. All of the Am I Ready series or tests follow the rules of Equestrian Canada found in section E of the dressage rule book. All of that is equally located online and we encourage you to take a look or again if you've got a particular question please feel free to reach out to me. 
So how do we get all started? So I'm just gonna flip back two screens and show you how we get to this. So give me a moment here to flip back. If you see the top yellow arrow, it says, am I ready series online portal? And where that takes you to, and pardon me as I flip through a couple of screens again, it will bring up the Am I Ready program. So what is this user's name and password? Well, if you're a current Equestrian Canada sports license holder, that would be you. That would be your number, and you would use the same password as you would to access my EC. Just note that we also use this for judges, so the judge would in fact tick off their judges box. So in logging in, where does that take us next? So we have the ability to submit a video. I should point out here that the only videos that we are presently able to accept are YouTube videos. Um, again, just to highlight and underscore the importance that the videos do need to be taken from the letter C. They're not to be or edits. Again, however, and there are always exceptions, if you are giving us a snippet of one particular movement, we do understand that that may not be a particular time that you will have that coming from the letter C. And I'll talk a little bit in the next couple of slides about security settings for YouTube, but um, most people will want to have that as private. So when you get into that first screen, and I've just gone here to kind of highlight, you'll be able to select the applicable level. We go all the way from introductory all the way up to FEI. So any of those tests that you wish to submit you can do so and you can do so for free. Don't forget to select which of those tests. So for example, uh, Joan had kindly gone through a training level test. So here we want to perhaps select training level test one. Matching test is. So I've talked a little bit about the URL and your YouTube video. So the last little box here would be YouTube in itself has a lot of uh, security aspects and does highlight how to go about submitting a video, how to start your account. So I just say to people that you may wish to list your video as unlisted. What that means is that we will see the video but people cannot search for your video online. The other thing that I also ask people to do, and sometimes it's just the way their cameras have gone or whatnot, here we can see this little eye icon and I've circled it in yellow. What does that do? Well, it allows you to preview your test. So for example, if it hadn't uploaded properly, there's lines through it, perhaps it's skipping, whatnot. You might just want to check your settings when you have, in fact, put it up and on. So the big important part to all of this, and I'll just go back, make sure this register button. Think of it as a submit button. And the way that you'll know that this has, in fact, been accepted, and I'll go on to the next screen, is it actually tells you, OK, so we're happy and a video is submitted and in fact at the office I received an email saying that your video has come in. At that point in time I'll see what judge is available and assign a judge. So to go back and highlight, once you've done that in submitting the video and you're kind of wondering well now what, you can actually go up to the upper right hand corner and there's something that says videos and it's a drop down menu. And you can take a look at the status. So I'm just pulled up an example here. And as I say, depending upon the time of year and the season and our judges availability, we kindly ask that you give at least two to three weeks for your video to be submitted 
for my being able to assign a judge, for that judge to be able to make some time within their schedules to review it. It's not um, a quick and easy process. And we'll talk about that. While it is quick and easy, it does still take some time is what I'm trying to say. So here you'll notice that on the second one, we end, oh, I should back up a little bit. So how would you get to here? You would log in just as you would if you're submitting, go to the drop down menu if it's not popping up on your screen of the list of videos and view remarks. Now here's the fun part, folks. So we hit view remarks and presto, your video is on the left hand side and the judge's remarks, and this is a screen here, I don't have all the details, but you'd be able to see one by one each of those remarks and the further remarks here. You can stop, start your video, you can also scroll through all these remarks. So you can really look at what the judge saw at that particular time and what might be influencing the fact that they gave you that 5.5 or perhaps you were fortunate enough to receive a 9.5. So all of this matches up here. And as I say, you can pause, rewind, play, and perhaps you even want to invite your coach over and take a look at this. And just because you've submitted your video once does not mean that you cannot submit it again. So we welcome you once you've taken all of this into account by all means, feel free to do another video and submit it, or perhaps it's time to move on and try another test. I'd just like to address one question that again came in from Lorraine Hill. So what, if any, considerations do you have to adjust in your scoring from live to virtual? And we've talked a little bit about this, Joan and I, and one of the big things is getting right back down to that quality of the video. So be again, quite cognizant of that and be aware that that may have a little bit of an outcome in that if your video's not clear or as clear as seeing a live rider in front of the judge, it makes it quite challenging. So at this point in time, I'm gonna throw it back to Joan who's going to talk a little bit about the whole process for the judges. So I will go back to one of the opening screens here and from the judge's point of view and sort of the process that they go through with all of this. And I do hope that we have a number of judges joining us online tonight and that you're really intrigued and interested by this program as well. We welcome you as well to assist us in judging some of these tests. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> well, we're back to this one. Okay. So now we go in the second part of the Am I Ready program, and it's the judge's point of view. So you can see it starts very much um, as with the user. Um, when you have um, a test to assess, EC will assign a username and a password to you, and you will note it on this page and sign in. And there, then you automatically go into it. You'll see a list of the videos that you have done in the past and the one that requires remarks. So you'll look here and you see, okay, one says add remarks. That is the one that I am going to judge. And you click on there, and there I am. I am ready to start judging. So, you can start and stop the video as needed and add points and remarks and save the review. Or you can look at, so if you, I'll just go over this though. So you see the screen here, you can go full screen, which I find is really helpful for the judging. And then to the right hand side, you have the test, you have the column for the points, and you have remarks, and they're expandable boxes. So if you're a wordy judge, you can get a lot in that part. So, um, 
uh, it, they mentioned here you can start and stop the video to put in your scores and remarks. Personally, I found it better to um, see the whole video on the large screen. And I had a piece of paper in front of me and I wrote down my scores and remarks. Then I went back to the first and like this, I played the test through and I entered my scores and remarks. Of course, I had to stop along the way to get everything in, but I found that worked quite well for me. Then the next step was um, the system does require you to submit the video. Do submit it because you, want, you don't want to lose what you have there, but you can review your video. Then you can go back over your video. You can review it. You can play it again. You can see how you scored things, your remarks. Do you have anything extra to add? Do you want to do further remarks? So um, it, it is something that I think works really, really well. I think the system is positive and it's a super mechanism for assessment of training at a variety of levels and even as Celine mentioned with specific movements. So it was a pretty simple, straightforward process. I did it, put in the scores, the test reviewed and off it went to EC. Now, you might even have some kind soul who could be your scribe. That's another option. I didn't have that option in doing mine. So one question that does come up though is about um, how does this differ from regular judging? And as Celine mentioned, it is so important the video be clear, high quality, done from C, follow the instructions provided, even the height of the camera at C is really important. You want to simulate the actual judging vantage point of the judge. And it gives the judge the best advantage in order to score your test. Um, I guess the next one is just a little, a little situation with me, but in my experience, in, in real life, I always feel very connected to riders in the rings in which I am judging. As a matter of fact, when I judge a show, I feel as though I'm riding along with the rider. And when things are good, I feel really good. When we have little blunders, okay, I have to manage that. But I find I don't feel as closely connected to that partnership as I do in real life. But maybe better quality videos could have an impact here. Um, I think too, um, sometimes, you know, there's people are doing their tests on a variety of different types of footing and that could well have an impact. But this Am I Ready program, super chance to observe your work, discover what looks easy, what you do well, what you can do better, maybe strive for those tens on those center lines. But try submitting a video, um, review your score tests, do it again, see if you do better, do the next test up, see how you do on that one. Or as Celine mentioned, you can do snippets of a test. And I know I've talked to someone about doing maybe um, some can, canter half pirouettes as you prepare for pre-St. George. Those are good ones to really get an analysis from someone else, a different set of eyes looking at that one, and that could be helpful. So that's um, my part on the judge's point of view. And if you have questions from the judge's point of view, please submit them and we will try to answer them in the latter part of this session. So let's prepare to do a video. I always say to riders, treat it like a dress rehearsal, make it like the real thing and you'll do your best. So that will end this part of the presentation. So we'll move on to a couple of questions that were submitted in advance. I know, Joan, you've had an opportunity to look at some. Perhaps we could start with a question that came in from Don Garrison. I do realize that we're facing a bit of a time crunch, and I'm also noticing at the bottom of my screen, we have quite a bit in the way of 
questions that have come in this evening. So we will try our utmost to get to your questions this evening. Okay, do you want me to um, do the questions, to go ahead with the questions and Celine? Yes, please. So okay. we'll start with the one from Don Garrison that you have. Thank you. Okay, so Don has a two-part question. She asks, scores have increased over the past 10 years or so, where a score in the mid 60s used to be exceptional. And we remember those. But now the threshold seems to be into the 70s or more. What accounts for this change? And I'm, my comment is, yes, we certainly see higher scores in dressage. This is due to the increased quality of our dressage horses. These horses are being bred for this sport. Many of them have the talent to just perform all of these movements with ease. As well, the riders are improving and the training continues to improve as well. So this has certainly resulted in an exciting sport. So you can see our, our, our sport has grown so much, but the quality overall is just incredible. And then part two of this one was, could you explain how judges may accommodate for a test ridden at a bronze, silver, or gold show? Is there any leniency toward the bronze level and higher expectations for the gold level? Well, I have to say there's one dressage judging system that applies to all levels. And that's why we focus on the training scale and the rules so we are consistent. Judges are encouraged to provide even more comments and feedback to the bronze level competitors. And hopefully they will feel encouraged and will continue to proceed through our, our sport. Do you want me to go to the next one, Celine? Yes, please. So we're gonna move along to a question. I'll just keep going, yeah. And then Roz asked me a question. Um, I made them, <laughs> Roz asked, as we are building a grassroots program here in Nova Scotia, called the Scotia Series, which includes a dressage division using EC tests. What are the core judging skills required for building quality entry-level athletes? I.e., some have the attitude that scores should be higher and more encouraging for riders new to the sport, while others, myself included, feel scoring should be realistic for riders at all levels of competition, while reflecting the expectations of the level. And I will say, Roz, we certainly agree that we need to encourage riders new to our sport, encourage all of our riders to improve and to continue with their sport. We, I would suggest for those lower level, entry level people, you might want to consider offering a ride to test day where those riders could practice a ride at their comfort level and receive feedback before they would then venture out to a recognized competition. Or there is the scenario where a person could ride a test, receive feedback from the judge, and then re-ride the test, working on the points that that judge had suggested. So those are two ways of um, addressing the needs of those entry level people. And I have to say the Am I Ready program may well be another opportunity to ride down center line and to get uh, a perspective from a judge. Um, I would also, there's lots of options on this one. I would encourage you to offer a variety of walk trot classes for entry level riders. It's a friendly way to introduce dressage. As well, there is a Rising Stars program it was developed by our colleagues in British Columbia and, and <clears throat> attracts really the youth. Includes a variety of EC tests, but also fun tests, pairs class, pre caprilli and so on. And there is an equitation division, which highlights the importance of strong riding skills. So it's particularly a fun introduction to the youth for youth riders. So there are some options that Hopefully, Roz, you would be able to consider and work into your program. Okay, um, on to the next one. Yes, um, I'll actually pose one um, from one of the ones that has come in. So do you see, this is coming from Jesse Bowen. Do you see different things the first time versus the second time? And- Oh, could you repeat that? You've lost the sound. Oh, do you hear me now? I hear you now. Okay. So, do you, 
change your thoughts and scores when you see something the second time with regards to a video? Mm, I think with judging, consistency is really important. And it's important to know the priorities, what you, the priorities are at each level and keep to that. Is that what, I'm not sure I've got the gist of it right, but um, yeah. I think for me, um, I judge the tasks that I see in front of me. Okay. So I'm gonna answer a question that's been posed by Tracy Watt. And okay. thank you for saying that it's a wonderful program. We appreciate the positive feedback. We think that it's wonderful too. So is there any information and details on the best video, like best way that it can be taken, what type of camera, Pixio, or just a good videographer? Um, personally, I have used Pixio. Just keep in mind that it's tracking your little fob that you're wearing on your wrist. And sometimes the zooming is not quite as accurate as perhaps having a live human being in behind that camera. Obviously, you'd like to try and have as good a quality as possible. In this time, as we're starting to get back and returning to sport after the break due to COVID and depending upon where you are in the country, I am aware of some facilities now offering video services to their riders. So you perhaps might want to check with your barn and see if that might be an option. Also take a look yourself and see what the highest quality is that you can upload. I know myself being here in a more rural environment, when I do go with a higher quality, it's a case of leaving it practically overnight for it to load on YouTube. But if you want to send me some more questions there, Tracy, if you feel that I haven't gone into enough depth, by all means, feel free to do so. And then the last one that we have so far that's coming uh, via the question and answer function at the bottom of the screen is, watching a video in two dimension, Joan, is very different than seeing it live in three dimensions. And how does this affect your assignment of scores? And I believe you addressed that a little bit earlier on when you said in terms of connecting to the rider, having the rider in front of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is different. Can you hear me okay? Can you yes. hear me? Okay. Yes, judging in front video is different. But um, one of the areas that I find is quite different is seeing maybe the consistent energy. When we're judging in real life, we can appreciate, we can see the power, the energy of the horses swinging forward. But in the video, it's harder to appreciate that energy. Now maybe with a better quality video, there would be a difference. Okay. Thank you, Joan. We'll just perhaps move along to the question that had been um, submitted earlier on, and I believe that you'd also had, Joan, talking about from Laureen, what is the key element in the collective mark for rider position? At FEI levels, this is the only collective mark, so it is an important one. Yeah, I agree, Lorraine. At the FEI level, the only collective is that rider. And it asks for the rider's position and seat, correctness and effectiveness of aids. And so at these levels, it's so important that the rider um, rides the horse forward into the contact, showing the movements that are required and with ease and harmony. One thing I, I noticed that the FEI is looking or having some discussion to change that to general impression mark. And I think that was mentioned in the webinar that was held two weeks ago, that we may see that change coming. So that would certainly indicate it's all encompassing. So the ease of the work, the rider's impact, the use of the aids. Thank you, Joan. So we've just had another question come in through the question and answer feature down at the bottom, asking myself a little bit about 
um, whether or not we're expanding this particular program to eventing tests and stay tuned is my response to that. We are just new to this program, so we are exploring that. But at this particular point in time, it's the Equestrian Canada need dressage test. So it is something that we're exploring for the future. Please stay tuned. Okay. And I have another um, question here. So this one for you, Joan, and I think we've kind of highlighted on it again. Um, when you're judging a test at the bronze, silver, and gold levels, what is the criteria that would distinguish the scores between the different levels? And I believe you had addressed this a little bit earlier by letting people know that, indeed, you've got a, a book <laughs> and the rules to adhere to. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, dressage judging is dressage judging. And so we follow the training scale. We follow the rules in our rule book. And um, I think as I mentioned before, we try at the bronze level to give even more comments, to be more encouraging even to those riders. Because you want them to learn and you want them to um, develop and return. So hopefully that will be something that will help them with the comment, comments. And we're getting more questions and thank you everyone for submitting your questions. I have another one here that someone is asking, how many times could you in fact submit a test? Well, you know, obviously within reason, we want to be able to give everyone a fair shot, but certainly we welcome you in resubmitting. So Catherine, if you have gone through that test and there was something that was of particular interest to you to resubmit, by all means, feel free to do so and we'll slate it as soon as we have a judge available. Now we did have another test that we, or pardon me, not test, goodness, talking too much about tests this evening. Um, that we had a question that came in earlier from Jackie, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name, I believe it's Zeons, that was talking a little bit about the release in the canter circle. And Joan, I believe you have that question available, so perhaps we could quickly go over that. We've got just about five minutes left to our evening. So I'll hand it over to you for, hopefully we can squeeze in the response to that one. Thank you, Joan. Okay, thanks. Okay. Oh, hi, Jackie. Yeah, this movement is a third level test too. And if I looked at the wording in the test, it's circle right 20 meters, uh, showing a clear release of both reins for four to five strides over center line. The directive, and that's the key point, eh, to tell you what to look for, is a clear release of the reins, Maintaining cell carriage, engagement, collection, shape, sides, and bend of circle. So the intent with this movement is to show that the horse maintains uphill balance in the giving of the reins. So the horse keeps a balance, maintains a circle, clearly on the aids, and follows that contact that you give. It is not like the stretch circle that we have seen much earlier in the training but this is for the canter, keeping the uphill balance. Okay, do we have time for one more? I think we've got time maybe even for two more because we're getting on a roll here again <laughs> with more questions. So if we can talk really, really fast, Joan. So I'll let you take one and then I've got one here waiting for me. So we'll try and squeeze these two in. Okay, okay, this one was from Allison. And she asks, can you explain the differences in what you expect to see between training first and second in terms of uphill balance, self-carriage, impulsion, and what, how that affects the scores? Allison, this is a really complicated question. So I'm going to try to gear it down to, let's look first of all at training level. And in training level, our focus is on balance. And we want to see a level balance is okay for satisfactory scores and fit going into fairly good. But there the horse moves freely forward with supple and loose muscles, accepting contact with the bit. Yes, we do see some horses that are showing that uphill tendency, even at this lower level. But, and if they're doing it correct, then they would 
the, have the possibility of those higher scores. First level, let's go on to that. Ask for greater suppleness with the horse on the bit. And at first level, we're really into the thrust and lengthenings being the challenge as the horse is learning to carry more weight behind. So it's all part of this development of the horse becoming more engaged and things becoming easier. Um, so oftentimes in the lengthenings, we do see the horses hurrying. We see maybe them haunches out, but these are problems indicating the need to develop strength and throughness. And then I'll step to second level is generally a huge challenge as this is where the horse is asked to accept even more weight on the hindquarters as we enter into collection at this level. This is where the uphill tendency comes in for the satisfactory scores or higher. And this uphill is often inconsistent as the horse may not be willing to transfer additional weight to the hindquarters. But it is part of the ongoing development of the horse and the need, again, developing strength and confidence at this juncture. I hope, Allison, this answers your question. There was a lot of details here, and I attempted to focus in on the balance and the engagement issues. Thank you for inquiring. So I'll just tackle this next question that came in very briefly. So it talks about this program seems like it could be an excellent opportunity to help train new judges and have them review a video and then compare to more senior judges' comments and scores. And certainly, yes, that is a discussion that we're starting and having internally, and we will probably roll that out. I can't give you a definitive timeline at this particular point in time because we are still going through a lot of um, testing and phases with this, but we are really excited by this program and I hope everyone is as well. So let me wrap this up this evening by sharing my last screen, a couple of screens with you. Again, many thanks to everyone for your excellent questions. You've really challenged us with some of them and I hope you've also seen the potential of this program and how easy it is to use. So let me just hop over to my screen again here. So for those of you who are certified coaches who've joined us this evening, I just want to bring to your attention that you can claim tonight for your updating hours. So if you have joined us, by all means, feel free to submit. And we say a copy, but you'll see, and you're probably aware of the certification maintenance form and emailing that either to your provincial coaching administrator or to Helen, so she can be reached at coaching at equestrian.ca. And just to note, you may claim one point per hour of attending this webinar. So you'd be able to attend three, and we're looking at giving a whole lot more in the way of webinars coming up. So just moving on a little bit, I know a little bit tired about talking about COVID. However, just to make you aware that there are a number of resources still available. So please feel free to take a look at our website. We have quite a bit of information available on the various responses and resources. In fact, one of our staff was in front of a parliamentary committee today and making them quite aware of what's happening to our riding schools and the impact of COVID on our riding schools. So talking about facilities, operations, mental health, it is important, please reach out to someone. Um, we also have some resources there for you and various publications. For those of you who have joined us from Ontario, please be aware that the Ontario Equestrian Federation does have a fundraiser going on right now and we encourage you to visit their website www.fortheherd.ca and last but not least thank you everyone for joining us we really do appreciate all of your positive feedback and comments again my contact information is here so Celine Hutchison Majerus 
dressage program coordinator. That's me. And you can reach me at chmajeris at equestrian.ca. Our offices are still closed due to the COVID pandemic, but please do reach out to me by email and I'll be sure to pass along any questions, any queries to Joan. You can equally reach out to Christine. I know she's been answering some questions on the chat as well. So those are available. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us tonight, and we look forward to offering more webinars in the future. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>